Noah Clifton, my firstborn. Thank you, Clint Clifton, my <laughs> earthly father. <laughs> Uh, so you're 18 years old and you've become a Christian in the last year. Yes, it will be one year on April 6th. Okay, man, so I, didn't like, realize it was that I didn't either till this morning. Okay. Do you mind just walking through uh, briefly, you know, your testimony from your point of view, how you came to faith in Christ? So obviously I grew up in a Christian household with Pillar. Uh, we started that church when I was like four or five years old. So growing up with it, all that. So I knew, obviously I knew about Jesus and the gospel and stuff like that, but I never really like took ownership, ownership of that or anything. So then entering my teenage years, I was uh, like, I knew it was something I probably should do, but it was nothing I ever did. So through, going through like missions trips with youth group and also just like being around pillar people and church planners all the time, I got to like see mission lived out, but also like have conversations with people about my faith. And the first person that really, outside of mom and you, who really asked me about my personal faith was probably Mr. Alex. He pulled me aside and was like, what's your testimony? I'm pretty sure he knew that I wasn't saved, but like he played it off like he didn't. And I was like, uh, okay. Looking back on it now, I was like, hmm. Yeah. But he asked me and I was like, I told him and he was like, yeah. all right. So then he kind of walked through the gospel with me. And then I was like, all right, I knew that, but I don't want to do anything right now. <clears throat> so he would continue to do that, him along with other people, other youth leaders and other, just like really members from the church who knew me and knew me well. Yeah. They would come up to me and talk to me about my faith when we get one-on-one, -on -one, stuff like that. Like I remember one time Ben Palka was doing it. Uh, Ethan James, I think was his name, he took me snowboarding all the way in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And the way back we had a conversation about it. Uh, Miss Lee had me over for lunch one time. We talked about, you were there with me, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Miss So just like different people in the church who knew I wasn't saved and knew you and mom and like loved you guys so they mm -hmm. wanted to help in any way they could so they would talk to me and then let's see fast forward a little bit uh to last year um our youth group went to a youth retreat with all saints church in woodbridge and i was like oh, okay it's just a youth retreat it'll be fun at first like i was the only youth to signed up to go so I was like oh it's just gonna be me Mr. Alex and Miss Debbie oh this will be fun but then a few more youth came along and so I was like all right cool it's just a youth retreat another youth trip done a hundred of these before nothing different so we go there and the second the last like night we're there mm -hmm. Mr. Alex was teaching and I can't remember like what he was teaching on but I remember sitting there thinking and he was talking about some one of his topics was spiritually spiritual warfare yeah. and how like the devil is constantly trying to like take you away from God and Jesus and the Lord so that really hit home with me that night but it was funny because the Wednesday before that was like a weekend trip the Wednesday before we had talked about Satan and the devil and how like basically John 10 10 now the devil has come to steal kill and destroy but Jesus has come to give life and give it more abundantly. So like that verse was something like we talked about a lot on the Wednesday before and uh, David Fletcher Fletch and Miss Amanda Johnson that really like went into it de in detail on that Wednesday. So it was like fresh in my mind and then Mr. Alex started talking about spiritual warfare. So it was like really into me, like into my thought process and stuff like that. So then afterwards, we had been split up into groups like all weekend. So we split up into our groups again to pray. And Mr. Alex had to split up, go one-on-one -on -one prayer time. And of course, like he had done a hundred times before, he picked me because he wanted to like another gospel chance. I was like, I knew it was coming. I purposely tried to stand in a spot where he would not, like it'd be Ill illogical for him to pick me to be his partner. But of course he picked me to be his partner. So we walked outside of the building we were in and we probably spent 45 minutes to an hour talking about the gospel yeah. and Jesus and all that stuff, why I wasn't saved, spiritual warfare, all that kind of stuff. And 
after a long like he was so calm and patient and me i was like freaking out you ever seen like movies where they have like the angel and devil and that's literally how like i felt that on me in that conversation like mr i was just kind of standing there watching me like have this conversation with myself with my little angel and devil on my shoulder like talking to me like do you want to be a Christian? Do you not? No, don't worry about it. You don't need to be. Oh, you need to be saved. You're a sinner. You need to you need Jesus. And I was like, ah. Uh. So like, I probably, no joke, spent there staring at the floor like this for 10 minutes. And Mr. Alex just sat there and stared at me. I'm sure he was like praying eternally, internally. But like, I just sat there and it was silent for like 10 minutes. I was just like in my own head. And I don't know what he was doing, but he was just... There and then I finally made the the decision to become a Christian and follow Christ, and yeah, me and Mr. Alex we sat there, we prayed, I prayed, and then he prayed over me, and we just kind of like man hugged and <laughs> both cried in each other's arms. So that was that was cool, and so we went walked inside, and this is more like two uh, this like after the like the ten minutes after being saved will probably be something I'll never forget. Um, I went inside. And Miss Debbie, she was at the youth troop too. I literally took three steps in the building and she grabbed me and took me right back out and just gave me a hug and was praying for me. And she was like, I was, she told me that she'd been praying for me like all week, just like, she, I was just really heavily on her heart that week. So I was like, that's really cool. And then I walked back in after Miss Debbie and they were singing the song, No Longer Slave. So I was like, oh, that's kind of fitting too. <laughs> and then uh, this, guy I knew, he's a friend of a friend, and he's just a super cool dude, solid Christian, and he came up to me, he was playing, actually, he was playing in the bands, like he was playing bass, and he sees me walk in, he puts his guitar down mid-song, and comes over and talks to me, he's like, can I just pray for you, so I, I told him everything, and he was just like, that's so cool, so he prayed for me, and then like, got back up and finished the song, so I was like, that's, that's pretty cool. That's good, man, made me tear up a little bit. <laughs> Um, well, your mom and I were praying for you too, that week particularly. Um, I remember that when you went, um, my, uh, my mom said, uh, that she thought this was going to be the week and she was praying, praying really hard for you, praying for each yeah, night. I remember that too. Yeah. It's like she got it in her text before. Yeah, she like, kind of hey, be knew. And she had told me that. And when you called me that night to tell me, um, wait, as soon as I saw your name on the caller ID, actually the first time it, we didn't connect. Yeah, I, I called could, you like six times because yeah, the place I was at had no service. Yeah, but I knew that's why you were calling. So I was so anxious to answer, but but the I phone wouldn't answer. <laughs> I couldn't remember, like I was trying to like dial it so good. I couldn't remember y'all's phone numbers. And the service was so bad. As I was like scrolling through Mr. Alex's contact information, I could not find y'all's phone number for a while. I was, I remember I had to sit like crisscross applesauce in a flower bed. That is the only place I could get service from. Well, um, the point of this conversation is really to, to help parents think about how to interact with their kids in regard to this. And so, <clears throat> um, so let's dissect a little bit or look back at the way we've interacted over the years about faith. I, I, let me tell you from my perspective how I thought about it, first of all. Um, I, I, was, I grew up in an environment where parents often pressured their young children uh, to become Christians. And the result of that was that often, you know, they would say things like, if, if you become a Christian, you won't go to hell when you die. And so do you want to be a Christian, Johnny? And so a little kid would say, of course, I want to be a Christian. They would pray a simple prayer, but then they would grow up and they would kind of come to an age of knowledge and understanding. And they would look back at that and say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yet they're, they had never kind of willfully received Jesus and, and decided to follow him and obey him. It wasn't, there wasn't the wrestle that you just described, you know, um, uh, so often what that looked like was they got older and started being disobedient to the Lord and they, they didn't, they weren't born again. I mean, they didn't have any like love for God that motivated them to live. So as a result of that, I, I, I think I was just so scared that I would put you in a position like that, that you would, you grow, you grow up in our home and you would be, feel pressure because of my job or, um, your mom and I's love for the Lord to, to, you know, so I guess the first question would be, did you feel that kind of pressure from us? Describe 
how you, I mean, I know you knew we wanted you to come to faith, but did that ever feel like pressure to you? Uh, I, I think I felt a little bit of pressure, but not from you and mom. I think like, just like you said, I think it was more to do with like, you're the pastor mm -hmm. and I'm the pastor's son. And especially cause I was the oldest that there was like some pressure. And then I think after like Ruthie got saved and baptized, there was a little more like added pressure that I probably put on myself. But I don't know. I remember like you would all, you and mom would always make it very clear that that's what y'all believed and you wanted me to be saved and believe the same stuff. But if we didn't, you were still gonna love me. Yeah. And you didn't, you never like, you kind of took the pressure off. Mm -hmm. You made it very clear that it was my decision and my, like I'm only gonna do it if I want to do it, and I believe that and it's not something that can be inherited. Like you can't. I don't get. I don't go to heaven because mom, mom loved Jesus. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so you, you, I think what you're saying is you felt kind of expectations of others. Maybe, uh, maybe you put that on yourself, or I don't know if others really willfully put that on you. Uh, but in terms of the way we related to you, you didn't ever feel that pressure. From no, us. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, there were, uh, and that was intentional for sure, just based on what I was just describing. But um, I, I will say that, you know, there were many times that your mom and I had conversations, and I, I thought, I, I wonder if we're doing the right thing. I wonder if we shouldn't just kind of pressure it into decision. <laughs> And oh it was, yeah, it's kind of a risk because it took me 17 years, it, and you yeah. saw you saw Ruthie, and she was like nine, and Isaiah was young too when they made their decisions. And then now I'm like 17, still haven't made a decision, so yeah. I can see where that can be uh, like scary. You like, oh, yeah. are we doing it right, or are we not? But I guess you also. Yeah. But looking back, I mean, one of the one of the things about the situation now is I I don't have any doubt about your uh, faith in Christ at this point because I know you wrestled through it and I know you you know encountered you know, interacted with the Lord and you came to faith on your own terms and in, in a sense and not you know I, I don't think at all man maybe maybe we pressured him and, and that's why he made it I think if y'all would have pressured me I probably would have made a decision and probably lived in a false faith for a while but like looking back and knowing like my thought process back then I probably would have been easily forced and I could have been easily like willing to do it because mom and dad made me yeah you're a, you're an unusually obedient child and a child who generally wants to please us so I I think I always sense that that, that we could have kind of pushed you there um, and, you know, because you're a little bit slow to act, you're, you're a little bit careful. That's probably the way to say it. Unlike me, where I'm not slow to act and I'm not careful at all. You're a little bit more like your mom in that regard. I, I, I think I, I process that by like, in, internally, I'm like, let me just push, push him, like throw him in the water. He'll learn to swim kind of idea. And, um, you don't really respond well to that though. Like though, I mean, you don't respond you know, uh, uh, rebelliously, but you don't, it doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work. You don't work. get the results you're looking for. <laughs> no. And I think, I think even though it was my impulse often to push you, I think the Lord was, you know, very good to give me patience in that regard. And that somehow I, you know, I was not concerned about it at all. I had a real clear sense that the Lord was going to use you and call you and draw you to himself. And, and it, and, in due season, you'd be ready for that. So I wasn't really anxious about that. I think in some ways you mentioned like Miss Lee calling you over to her house. And I know David Fletcher uh, was praying for you a ton. Um, I, you know, I, he, uh, he sent me as soon as he heard that you'd come to faith, he, he sent me a screenshot of his alarms on his phone where he had been uh, an alarm daily uh, reminding him to pray for you. For, he said for, for years it had been that way. And, uh, and so, uh, those kinds of things really were a reminder to me that like there were, you know, it was a, it was a, the process of the church as a whole to, to help you come to faith and not just he and your mom. Yeah. And I think I didn't really pick that up before, but afterwards, after I got baptized and shared my testimony in front of the church, I got a lot of people that would come up to me and be like, man, you don't know how long we were praying for you for, or like, 
Cody Davis. He, he was one of the first people I called afterwards. And he was just like, he freaked out. He was, you know, he's like, I've been praying for this for so long. Yeah. And he's just like, dang, now we can start a church together. I was like, oh, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. One thing at a time. Yeah, one thing at a time. Well, that's good. Uh, all right, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, parents who are have got really little kids and they're thinking about interacting with their kids about faith. Like, can you think of any advice that you would give them? Um, about how to how to pass along their faith onto their kids in a way that's genuine and not not false. Um, well, I think first off, I think you lead by example. Your kids will follow. One thing I've learned just growing up is that one that you're going to see people in authority that you want to emulate, and also that people are going to see you whether you know it or not. So if you just live your Christian, if you walk in the way you're supposed to. They'll see that, especially your kids, because they're going to be around you a lot. They'll see how you spend, they'll see you in your quiet time. They'll see how you interact in your weak moments and your strong moments, not just like the one time at church where you can put on the Christian look. They yeah. see you all the time. They know the <laughs> lowest things about you, whether you think they do or not, whether you think they pick it up or not. So I think, one, being genuine in your faith would be a good example for your kids and also praying for them. I think that's a big thing too. Praying, yeah, like you said, don't don't put that added pressure on them. Let them know that it's their faith and not, they don't get to heaven through your faith. So those are just a few things I yeah, can think of. Yeah, that's really good. Um, so let me, let's talk about those couple interactions you had. It intrigues me a little bit. The, the time you said Miss Lee invited you over to her house for a meal. Um, that was, that was quite, I was like, I wasn't, I think I was like 10 or 11 or something. Like, I wasn't very old. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know the leaders too, the leaders are one of the oldest couples in our church and they're in their seventies. And, and, um, so it was an unusual, like, I know. They talk to you a lot, and they love you and mom, but I don't talk to them that often. Right. I talk to them maybe every other Sunday, every three Sundays. Well, I think that might be a result of Miss Lee coming to me and saying, I'm really concerned about Noah because he's not a Christian. And me saying, well, have you talked to Noah about that? You know, and rather than, you know, I think her impulse was to talk to me about talking to you. And, and you said, why don't you do it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, and not to pass the buck as much as to say, like, if you're burdened for that, just like you would with any other person, you know, express that to them. And then I think when she invited you over, you wanted me to go with you. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why I went with you. I think I would have just, like, let you go by yourself. <laughs> also, they live in, like, a 55 and older community. So to me, as an 11-year-old, I thought that meant, like... Nobody under 55 was allowed in the neighborhood, so I thought I was going to get in trouble. So I figured if Dad was there too, I wouldn't get in as much yeah. trouble. And then um, you mentioned some other people who, who talked to you, Alex. Alex, regularly. Mr. Alex. It, every time one on one with every every time there was like a chance to go one on one, he was always my partner. He was always he would always had a conversation about it. Yeah, I can so, remember at least like ten conversations with him about it. Yeah, and you said that he would he would ask you explicitly. No, he'd be he does not beat around. He gets straight to the point. Like one, I remember one time we were doing something, and like everybody had just cleared out, and just me and him, and we were just like talking, and then he was like, "So why don't you love Jesus?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> he didn't, I don't think he said that, but he was like, "Why aren't you a Christian?" <laughs> I remember commonly in our conversations, he's like, why aren't we saving, why aren't you being saved right now? And I just was like, uh. <laughs> um, and then you said Ethan, uh, Ethan was just a random Marine. He was just a Marine, yeah. and I don't, he liked snowboarding, so he took me snowboarding one time, and on the way back, he was like, what's your relationship with Jesus? And I was like, uh. <laughs> And now you probably know that the only reason he took you snowboarding was so yeah, you could have that now, conversation. Yeah, looking back now, I was like, oh, you only wanted to talk about Jesus. Because you guys didn't, like, have a relationship before that. It was pretty no, random. No, right? we didn't really have one afterwards either. It was just kind of <laughs> like, I, like, when I saw him, I'd be like, oh, hey, Ethan. But it wasn't like, yeah, yeah. I, I think he moved not too long after that either. Yeah, and Ben Palka too. Ben Palka. Uh, 
yeah, I know, I know a lot of the church planting guys who have come through have had an interest in, in your faith and prayed a lot for you and um, as well as people from the church. So just so cool to see how so many people coming around can, can have results. <music>
the you could make the false you know you could make yourself into a little Pharisee where you think like I'm good to go because my dad's you know a pastor and our everybody in our church looks at me and respects me and thinks highly of me so I'm good to go I don't need to rec you know reconcile with Jesus um, so anytime there was an option or an opportunity where somebody asked about you I I would take that opportunity to say yeah pray for Noah he's wrestling through you know whether become a Christian now or not. Um, and I really, you mean a lot to me if you pray for him. So, and, uh, I don't, I don't know if you ever heard me do that. If I ever did that in front of you, but I definitely did that a lot. I figured like, after, like thinking about knowing we were going to have a convers this conversation, I was thinking about, it, oh, he probably did do that. Yeah. Well, Noah, thanks for taking time to talk to me about this today. I know it's, uh, I know it's maybe not the most fun thing to get on camera, but I appreciate it. No problem. Well, thanks for watching the conversation between uh, Noah and I today, and we wanted to just take a moment and and debrief that conversation in just a minute with uh, Pastor Colby here. So, I mean, I think the big takeaway for me, uh, Colby, from that conversation and even rehashing it again with Noah was was uh, a reminder to me that we have to trust the Lord in, yeah. in regard to the salvation of our kids. Nothing we can do is going to result in, in them coming to faith in Jesus. Jesus yeah. does that work in them. Uh, on his own, with without us, in a sense, you know. Yeah, it's it's an incredible conversation to watch and yeah. to listen to, um, because you can see that there's there's kind of these two really strong pieces. Yeah. Uh, there's this aspect in which um, you guys took a real active role, uh, talking, engaging, regular personal one-on-one -on -one conversation. Other people taking yeah. active role. I, I was so encouraged to hear just. You know about the church and yeah. the role of other Christians, and we forget about that as parents right. sometimes. And so it's really great. Like this would be my you know plea to people out there: like get your children involved regularly, and deeply in a local church. Yeah. That's one of the best things you can do to pass on your faith. Yeah, we uh, just a minute on that. We think that you know making our kids you know socializing them and educating them and yeah. all those things are the most. Those important. are the opportunities, right? and uh, and so many people forsake the assembly in order to get, have their kids involved in all these other things that, that their mind tells them is more important. Uh, there's nothing more important than, than their walk with Jesus, and therefore there's no institution more important for them to be engaged in than the local yeah. church. Yeah, and so on one side you've got the active work of Christians and parents praying, working, serving, but then we're reminded, John chapter 3, like it's a mystery. The Spirit blows where He wants, and we can see the effects, but... Uh, at the end of the day, salvation belongs to our yeah. God. And really, we eat all the things that parents try to do sometimes to uh, shortcut that and to press their kids. And uh, if it fails the test that we feel internally, like I would really have confidence about right. that, then we're probably taking a bit of a step too far in, term, in terms of forcing a decision. Yeah. If we'll just trust the Holy Spirit to do the work of drawing people to genuine faith while we converse with them. Yeah. That's it's going to put us in a place where I think our kids will have confidence in their own faith too. Yeah, and I think it's anxiety producing for kids for us to like have this heavy weight and pressure on them, and it also communicates like we don't trust God. You know? Yeah, and I, I mean I want my kids to grow up knowing that I want them to love Jesus and serve Jesus. Yeah. That's the best life they could possibly live, but also knowing that I trust Jesus enough that I, I don't have to put that pressure on them in a false way. Yeah, and in that sort of Patience does one other thing that I think is really important for our teenagers and for anybody that they're developing. It gives space for the fact that they're not going to have answers to all the questions they have and all the questions they face. And so uh, we're not afraid to have them voice them because we trust the uh, power of the Holy Spirit to draw them and the power of the Holy Spirit to keep them through the midst of their questions as we help them answer tough challenges, go through times of doubt. It's not dependent on us. Yeah. And we, we believe wholeheartedly that it's the Holy Spirit that brings about the change of heart and life that we really want to see. Yeah. One other thing I'd say as a takeaway from this, I think for people who are watching is if as a part of our church or, or whatever church you're a part of, if the Lord prompts you to um, interact with somebody, a teenager, a kid, somebody else that is you sense is wrestling with things of faith or, or, yeah. or anything, yeah. like go talk to them. I mean, so thankful for Ethan and Alex and Lee and even, even now, the impressions of those made, even though none of those interactions uh, resulted in him coming to faith in Christ, all of them played critical roles. In a way, all of them did. Yeah, they all yeah. did. And so, so God will use you too as you obey the Lord when he prompts you to go and, and share the good news.